everyone. Welcome to today's session on building a movement for our emerging dance marathon programs. My name is Kyle Stepp and I am a dance marathon acquisition manager out in the West. Um, and you'll also be hearing from my colleague Becca today as well. Make note about any questions that you may have throughout the presentation as we go on. And at the end, we'll direct you to drop them in our Discord channel at the end of our presentation. Um, but we're excited to kick off building a movement. Hey everyone, like Kyle said, my name is Becca and I am a current dance marathon manager in the Southeast area. And I am very excited today to talk to you guys about building a movement and everything that goes into that. Um, like Kyle said, any questions go in the Discord channel. If you're not a member of the Discord channel, you can join it now. I believe it is new and emerging and you should be able just to hop on in there and we will look forward to chatting with you guys in there too. So the first thing that we are going to talk about is branding. Um, branding to me, not a marketing person at all, is kind of a scary term. I look at branding and I always go like, I don't know what the heck that is or how to build a brand or what goes into a brand. So we're gonna give you the quick brand details and then we will suggest other sessions for you guys to go to to learn even more about branding. Um, but the first question is why does a brand matter? Why do uh, we as student organization leaders have to work hard to make a brand and to make sure that we're in line with our brand? Um, and there's a few reasons for that. I mean, a brand gives you guys a very intentional look and feel to all of your materials. If you think about um, some of the most successful brands, it's that it's not just color palettes and graphics requirements and dimensions and things like that. It is an attitude, it is a feeling, a brand inspires you to feel some way. It um, you know, brings up emotions that you want your participants to feel. So when our participants see something about Dance Marathon on campus, we want them to feel happy. We want them to feel family. We want them to feel included. It is a place where you spur emotion. So um, it is important that you put effort into how you're presenting things and where you're presenting things because soon that will be where your participants feel at home in your branding. If you think about some of your favorite brands in the for-profit world, you know, you know that a product is more than the product they make. A product is what the company stands for. It's what um, you know, they believe in and they convey that in their brand. So hopefully we can do the same with Dance Marathon. Um, it's easily recognizable on campus. So when you see a folder or a flyer up and posted on campus, we want people to know immediately that it's about Dance Marathon. Um, we don't want them to have to read a bunch of text to see that, that it's a Dance Marathon flyer. We want them to know. Um, and then it also just gives you a place to make unity, to be consistent, to um, share your message in a way that is the same all the time, um, which is also very important for, you know, spreading recognition on campus and building your um, movement throughout the years. So I have a few examples of a program that just recently went through a brand refresh. Um, and so I'm going to show you sort of where they started and then where they went. Um, this is the University of Mississippi Rebelthon. So if you can find them on Discord, if you have any questions, marketing people, please reach out to them. They will be able to answer. But you can see here two examples of sort of what their brand used to be. They used blue and red a lot because that was their university colors. They used, you know, block lettering. It kind of, it, they look nice. It, these, there's nothing wrong with these graphics, but it doesn't really inspire you to feel a certain way yet. Um, it's all uniform, basically just the same. You can see their color palette includes, you know, three or four colors. It's not anything super intense. So this year, the students got together and they decided we want to be more than that. We want to stand out on campus. We want people to, you know, recognize our cause and our brand. We want them to um, see us as a more playful organization, a more energetic organization. Um, and so how do we do that? And so now you can see a few examples of what they've sort of pivoted to. And I will move our video so that you can see them, but you can see that their color palette is greatly expanded. If you look at their logo, um, there's lots more than two colors and there's lots more than blue and red. So they still have those blue and red elements in there so that you know, the university feels present, but you can see that their font is different. They use lowercase as opposed to uppercase all the time. So it looks a little bit more childlike, it looks a little bit more playful, and it has a little bit more energy. Um, 
And these are not drastic shifts that they made. They changed the color, they changed the font, but they usually, uh, you know, use similar graphic building blocks. And, but the key is that it's totally different feel from both um, posts here. So I wanted to give you guys an example of some small things that you can change that could have a really drastic impact on your brand. Um, oops, let me go to the next slide. Um, and so I also just created some examples of branding guidelines. So what exactly are branding guidelines? What needs to be included in branding guidelines? You can see that usually it gives an overview. It gives examples of the logo. It gives a color scheme or color palette. It gives a font that you guys like to use. And then it can also talk about what needs to be added to every post. So you can see like here on the bottom example, there are how to post on platforms, what to post where. Um, you can see here that Soonerthon has added, okay, you need to have this logo or this flame on every single post that we post on social. Some kind of, you know, the more logistics, the more nuts and bolts of what needs to be included in a brand. Um, there are a lot of examples on our, in our Dropbox resources um, that you guys can go click through and see what other programs have done in terms of brand. And to hear from some experts that are not me, who did not get a degree in marketing, uh, you can go to our Branding 101 session. That will be University of Central Florida. They have done a lot with their brand recently and sort of rebranding on campus. Um, the students will talk to you about how they instilled the feeling of that brand and everything like that. So please make sure to tune in. If it's not available right now, it will be dropping in the next couple of days. Uh, and that is a great way to learn about the starting point of a brand. Um, so transferring that into social media, um, which is where your brand will be present a lot of the time, we're going to talk about really how to make your social media social. So um, there is a reason that it's called social media. It's not called information media or anything like that. Um, really, your primary goal on social media should be not only to inform, but to drive meaningful engagement on your platform. So how do we drive likes? How do we drive comments? How do we drive, you know, conversations being started on our social media. And that's gonna require a little bit more than you guys just posting graphics of information and words. Um, you need to feature people on your social media. When you're creating graphics, think about how you can incorporate uh, photos of real humans on your social media, of your families, of your children, things like that. Um, and then really think about how you can start conversations. One of my favorite examples ever um, and this was used by a program to help prove why they need like university funding and why it is a student organization on campus. But instead of posting a graphic that said, donor drive is open, register for our event now, they posted a picture from their marathon the past year. And they said, um, tag your favorite person to experience DM with and share your favorite memory of DM. And then also in the corner, they said, register here. So um, they got thousands of comments on that post of people just saying, oh my goodness, remember in 2014 when we did this, or remember last year when this happened, so and so. And they had so many engagements, the impressions were in the thousands because they drove a conversation intentionally, but they also got that information across of you can register on Donor Drive now. Um, so thinking about ways you can do that, thinking about how you can if you have some dead space in your posting schedule, how can we just post something fun that gets people talking and gets people engaging with us? Um, because a wonderful side bonus of that is the more people that comment on your post, the more networks that your post is getting pushed out to. So if an alumni comments, you know, all of their friends and all of their, you know, recent people are going to see it, but then also it's just going to get propelled into whatever the algorithm thinks it should be um, at rates much higher than if people were just to like it. So um, engagement is your best friend when it comes to spreading information on social media. Um, another really, really important part is going to be um, you have a lot of different platforms. So your content should not be the same on every platform. My biggest pet peeve is when people just copy things they post on Facebook and then post them on Instagram or their stories or whatnot. That is not how you make social media your best friend. Uh, the people that are interacting with you on Facebook are not the people that are interacting with you on Snapchat or Instagram or, you know, even Twitter, if you still use a dance marathon Twitter. But, you know, there are going to be different kinds of people on every platform. So making sure that you tailor your information to what kind of people you're trying to reach. For example, 
an Instagram story, you have way less time to capture someone's attention than a Facebook post or a Facebook event or something like that. So make contact that's uh, our content that is bite sizable is what I like to say is um, quick and easy and it gets people to do what you want them to do in three seconds or less. Um, whereas Facebook, that might be a better place to engage with your miracle families because parents are on Facebook more frequently than children are, or, you know, things like that. So really, really challenge uh, content people yourself in that thinking that you can use the same thing or even the same graphic on every site. Um, that gives people a little bit, I think, of fatigue as well. You don't want to tire people out. You don't want to seem overbearing if they see the same graphic on every single feed that they log into. So really, really think about what you post where. And, and Becca, one thing to note, um, so throughout our DMLC, we're actually going to have a ton of workshops on social media and as well as how do you create really engaging content, um, whether it's our, we're going to be doing workshops on how do you make 60 second videos to how do you distribute your content. We're also going to have some experts from Chipotle um, that are going to be talking about their social media strategy and how can Dance Marathon take those best practices. So there's a ton of more information on how do you best build out your um, social media and content. Awesome. Um, and then really the last thing about social media is just it should be tailored to your participants. It shouldn't be tailored to your leadership team or uh, your alumni. The people that need it the most are the people you're trying to attract this year and the people you're trying to engage with this year. So my favorite question for you guys to ask yourself all of the time, really when you're doing anything, is does this enhance my participants' experience? And if the answer is not a clear yes, then maybe reevaluate what we're posting and what we're doing. So I included these two examples because you can see here on the highlights, um, they have stuff very easily available to their participants. They have tips, they have newsletters, they have the blog, they have their merch, they have shout outs, all of that. So making sure that when you're thinking about building out the experience of people on your social media sites, that you're thinking about making information easily accessible, making it you know, bite-sized enough that they can consume it quickly, um, and then also just laying it out in a way that is appealing and visually uh, attractive so that people don't scroll through your social media and ignore things, certainly. And, and I think, Becca, as you're talking about um, that participant focus, the more and more that we could recognize um, the individuals that make up this movement, it's also going to generate um, that engagement um, because we all love to see ourselves on social media and we love to see those posts and we're, we're going to share it. Um, we're going to share it on our channels, which ultimately becomes a much more organic way. Um, and I think when you, when you see your friends um, and individuals on campus that are being posted about, you want to go comment, you want to go like, you want to go celebrate them. Um, and that's the best way because the, when you see a person on social media and like on a picture, um, you're more likely going to engage because that's a friend. Um, it kind of puts that social back into that social media rather than you, you don't see as many engagement when it is a graphic. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, Becca. And so next, we're going to dive into um, the next part of how do you build a movement is how do you recruit? Um, and recruitment is a lot more strategic than you think, and especially in order to get someone to join your organization and join Dance Marathon. And one of the first steps um, in order to how to recruit is your pitch. Um, you know, I, I use the example of a pitch is, you know, you're wearing a Dance Marathon t-shirt. Um, you walk into Trader Joe's, um, mm -hmm. favorite store, hands down, mm -hmm. uh, and someone asks you, hey, what's Dance Marathon, and what do you say in that moment? Um, what do you say in that moment that really grasps their attention and makes them want to join what you're doing, um, makes them excited um, to hear what you're talking about, and there um, also, there's a clear call to action. Um, at the end of your compelling pitch. And so our, our friend Simon Sinek has this beautiful way of framing a pitch um, is through a why, how, and a what. Um, really, people join um, things for purpose. Uh, I think that's really why people get involved is really that purpose or cause or belief is the reason why our organization exists and why they're going to join. And right at the beginning of your pitch, it's really important to start with a why. Um, being able to share a compelling story about why you're personally involved. Um, and I think that is everyone has a different reason, um, but because there's a personal tie to it, um, you know, some, it may be they were involved and, you know, they benefited from their local children's hospital. 
and they share a story about their time at their hospital. They share about the little boy or little girl that they met at Dance Marathon the previous year. Um, and they talk about their story and when they see that smile on their face. Um, for some, like it could literally be like, this is the organization where I feel welcomed and I'm involved on campus. And I feel like my college experience is more than just going to class. Um, and it gives me that sense of purpose while at school, but really starting off with that why. After we share about why um, someone should get involved, it's really important that we're upfront with them and tell them what they're getting into. Um, that is, you know, why when we look at that, where we want people to attend that main event um, and fundraise is it starts with setting out clear expectations of what it means to be a part of Dance Marathon. You know, we are a fundraising event and organization um, and setting that standard from the beginning but there's a lot of impact that you can share about why we're a fundraising organization and the need of your local children's hospital and how you are meeting that need. Um, and because of us, um, this is that our children's hospital has these pieces of equipment, these programs, these services um, because of us. Um, and that's going to really get people excited about why to fundraise. If we just say, Hey, yeah, we're, we're raising money for a children's hospital. Cool. But why, um, what is that meaning behind that fundraising? Next is being confident. You need to know your why, um, because if you don't know why you're involved, why should someone else? Um, I mean, the way people join people, you know, so often um, when you sign up for Dance Marathon, you see your friends sign up for Dance Marathon, um, they may be driven by the organization and the mission and the cause, but really they're joining because you invited them um, and they're excited because you're excited. Um, and so being, being to have that confidence. And then last is really knowing your audience. This is something really important is being able to tailor your pitch um, to what their interest is. You know, we've really identified three main reasons that most people join Dance Marathon. One is for the cause connection. Um, they may be passionate about supporting their local children's hospital. Um, they may have a little brother, a little sister that was treated at their local children's hospital, um, or maybe they personally were and they're really passionate about that. So let's talk to them about hospital tours. Let's talk to them about the patients and families um, that we, we serve and represent and are involved in our organization. Um, next um, is social reasons. Um, honestly, <laughs> a lot of people join Dance Marathon because it's fun and that's totally okay. And I think that's a really great opportunity to talk about all the fun events that you all will put on throughout the year, um, the exciting momentum that push days and push weeks happen on campus. Um, and then really that final main event um, that culminates your year and how it brings people together and it's unforgettable. Um, the games, activities, the competitions, and really drive that home because that's what's gonna get them to wanna join Dance Marathon. And then lastly, we know as, as our generation and as Gen Z, um, we come to college to ultimately get a job um, and find a career. And how can Dance Marathon be a vehicle to help develop them as a person um, to get them to land them a job? Whether that is, you know, just being a participant yourself and talking about that fundraising experience. Um, through every career you have, you're going to have some sort of human interaction and have to sell something. Um, and so being able to share that direct experience of being able to fundraise for such a large organization on campus um, and being a part of this organization and really sharing with them that leadership development that you're getting um, out of being a part of Dance Marathon um, and sharing that direct connection on how it can help them post-grad and directly correlate with what they're learning in the class um, to ultimately get them a job. And so, so your pitch is really important on, you know, what you say and how you say it. Um, and that's going to be the first way that you get someone to join the organization. Next is that registration experience. So um, one thing I did, I, I meant to mention when you are doing your pitches is spending the time as a leadership team and just practicing. Um, at the beginning of the year or at your, at your leadership team retreat, taking the time just to practice your pitch, give each other feedback. Um, and, and also like if someone has like one of those really cool lines that get them to join the organization, totally do it. Um, take it, you know, apply it to you, but really that pitch also is going to set the expectation of your organization and your experience. If you want Dance Marathon to be a year round movement, share that. If you want people to fundraise and come to events and participate in Dance Marathon, share that in the pitch. Um, but really 
the, the experience that a participant is going to have um, and how you want them to engage is going to start based upon how you articulate it in that pitch. Um, so next is that registration experience. So really, there's going to be multiple ways that a participant may register for Dance Marathon. Um, the first is going to be that landing page of Donor Drive. So if you haven't had your donor drive set up for this year, make sure you reach out to your CMED hospital advisor um, to get your donor drive page set up. And it's really important that you have all um, the essential information on your donor drive, the date, location, time of the event, um, your, this, who you're supporting, why you're supporting, really customizing your donor drive because that's going to be the first landing page that a participant has. Um, we have done everything we can um, to make sure that it is mobile friendly, participant friendly, um, and really easy to use and navigate. Um, so it's a seamless experience for your participants. Um, so through everything you do, every tabling event, um, visit to a student organization, or, um, or on your social media, that donor drive is accessible so that someone can sign up. Um, so through every bit of your marketing material and your outreach, um, is that's one of the first things you share with them. So next is going to be your social media and your marketing. Um, as Becca was mentioning in the social media section is really the link in the bio is a great place as a landing page for someone to go register for Dance Marathon. Um, so one, a great resource that um, a lot of social medias have is called Linktree. Um, so if you click that Linktree, it has multiple boxes. Um, it's so easy to say, hey, um, link in the bio. And sometimes it's so hard to switch out all the different links all the time. So there's one link that you could use um, that goes to all of your different hyperlinks for what you're trying to achieve. I um, mean, you can pin your registration box as your number one. Um, so they always go there and they can click to register. Um, next is going to be your marketing material. Um, so if you have a digital sign on campus and you're saying register for Dance Marathon, um, that link is super accessible. We also can help your team set up a text to register. Um, so if you have those digital signs on campus or printed signs, makes it really easy where they can, you know, they can, they can text Lobothon to the 51555. And when they do that, there's a text back right to them um, that shares, hey, thank you so much for your interest in signing up for Dance Marathon and it has a link right there. So making it really seamless um, for the participant. Next is gonna be your on-campus tabling and engagement. So often you see so many tables on campus um, for so many clubs and organizations. So let's make it interactive. Let's make it fun. Um, it's really important that when, we're, when we have those tables, we have laptops set up so that if someone comes up or an iPad or even that text to register um, right there through their phone um, is so that they could come to the table and after you give them that pitch, there's a quick, easy ask of saying, hey, we would love to invite you to sign up for Dance Marathon and they could do it right then and there. Um, and then lastly is gonna be your team recruitment. Really going from um, one of the best ways to get a large group of the mass of students on campus to register and sign up for Dan's Marathon is going organization to organization. Um, and Becca's gonna be highlighting that here in a little bit about that pitch to the different student organizations. Um, but really when you're, in that, when you're in that student organization, do you have flyers to hand out? So they, there's the text to register. Um, makes it super easy for those teams, those organizations to sign up right then and there. Next, recruitment is everyone's job. Um, I'm going to say this again. Recruitment is everyone's. Um, because really, it, it takes all of us on, on our leadership teams to bring people into the dance marathon movement. Um, your recruitment team and your participant relations team um, are really the, um, the creators of the strategy um, and where that strategy is executed and implemented um, and inviting people into our organization is each and every one of our exec board members. Um, we're really um, the arms of our organization and reaching out to bring people into our, our dance marathon movement. Um, so it's really ensuring that every executive board member one understands how your dance marathon organization runs and operates. Um, if you're if you're lucky enough that you already have committee members and and volunteers, is ensuring they're all well equipped with um, what is dance marathon, um, how do we fundraise, why do we fundraise, where's our impact to the hospital. But they have a really good education and information, and so that um, if if we are on campus in our classes or in our student organizations, we're well equipped 
um, to educate our peers and invite them into Dance Marathon and have the confidence to do so. You know, one of the things that um, I, we often say is that, you know, the minute that a participant registers for your event, um, that plays into the retention for next year. Based upon their complete experience with the registration, fundraising, and participant on the event day, they'll decide if they come back. Really thinking from um, a holistic approach of like not from the moment that someone registers to the moment they leave your dance marathon event, what is that experience? And how do we make sure that it's, it's unforgettable, it's seamless, it's inspiring. Um, it's not just a register and an attendee event. There's a lot in between that happens. And so we look at that from really a participant life cycle. And, you know, a participant life cycle is the full experience that a participant will have with your dance marathon organization. Um, you know, it really starts with, with that registration experience to why is fundraising important? Um, immediately after someone registers, we're educating them. Um, we're educating them on the fundraising um, and the dollars that you're raising is, is making an impact at your local hospital. Um, after they know why it's important, how do I fundraise? Um, in, in a couple of our sessions, we talk about how do we templatize, uh, templatize things and make it really easy for someone to fundraise. Um, so often, after they understand why $100 is so important, um, how do I reach that $100? And making it really easy and simple for the participant. The next after do that is that we're gonna dive into what else do they need to know about Dance Marathon? Um, really the special events throughout the year, um, the experiences at the main event, but really giving them that painting, that picture of everything that goes on with Dance Marathon and that they're a part of something. And then lastly is showing that the money raised is a part of the final total, knowing that every dollar, every impact that you're making as an individual is a part of that collective final number. Yeah, and so Kyle was talking a little bit about team recruitment. I think that's a great place for you guys to really start um, when you're thinking about who will be the basis of, you know, our participant base. You guys will have participants that <clears throat> register for your event without being on a team, but I would probably say that at least 80% of your participants will most likely be on a team or will want to be on a team to help build those connections and um, experience that main event with. So really when you think about recruiting teams and when you think about approaching a an organization to make a team you have to think of this as a partnership and you know the main thing that that organization might ask or might be thinking when you're pitching to them is what is in it for us why should we do this it sounds like a lot of work it sounds like we're going to be giving a lot to you guys and you know why does it make sense for my organization to do that so thinking about um really what does dance marathon mean to these different organizations on campus if you are going to pre professional groups or pre health services groups you know thinking about nursing clubs and pre medical pre dental things like that these are the people that are going to be in our healthcare system and they're going to be they might work in a children's hospital one day so this is valuable exposure to the uh, local hospital they can go on hospital tours they can maybe even shadow and days in the hospital things like that so you know, making sure that your pitch to these organizations is specific based on what they want. Um, if you're going to, you know, a Greek organization or another campus organization that might need service hours or service requirements or philanthropy requirements, um, these Dance Marathon could be the place that these organizations give back to the campus and to the community. So promoting yourself as a philanthropic platform, a cause impact platform, but also just a great way for, you know, their organization to be a part of something bigger um, at the university. And, you know, your hospital advising team, your CMN advising team is more than happy to, you know, reach out and commend these organizations. We have plenty of people um, myself included, that will write letters to head, Greek headquarters if, you know, a Greek partner is really strong on campus or if it's like a national service organization, anywhere that has sort of like a national headquarters, multicultural organization headquarters, we will write um, letters on behalf of CMN hospitals thanking them for their participation in Dance Marathon. Um, and that's really awesome as a student if they can receive a call from their advisor from the national organization and say, great job. Uh, you know, my boss just told me that they got a letter. So um, we are certainly there to help you guys pitch this as a mutually beneficial partnership. And we, we want to help in that aspect as well. Um, it is also very 
uh, key for you guys to go to this organization and say, what do you want out of this relationship? You know, how can we make this a mutually beneficial uh, partnership? You might not know how they want to be involved or how they want to give back. So making sure that you start every partnership with just an educational conversation, whether it's with their service chair, their philanthropy chair, their president, um, whomever it's with, just learning about what they need to so that, you know, you can listen to them and how to build this partnership to the most effective um, way possible. And um, real quick with that, Becca, I think one important thing is about the student organizations, the leadership um, has the same turnover like ours. You know, as a student organization, every year there's a new set of leadership. Um, and so it's really important that we go to that new set of leadership to build that relationship. Um, so often, you know, we just, as we, as we grow, as our dance marathon program grows, um, we just assume that everyone wants to sign up for dance marathon and participate with our, with our movement. Um, but because that leadership is new and in their, and their focus for their year may change, it's important that we go back to that organization every year and reestablish that relationship. Um, so this isn't just a one time forming a lasting relationship, but every year um, going to that organization and building a partnership. Yeah, absolutely. And demonstrating impact when the year is over. So you know, we don't have to start at square one every year, but we do have to say, this is what your partnership meant to us this past year. Yeah, no, that's, you know, Becca, that's a great example. You know, um, going, let's say after you finish your first year and you're wanting a, a team to re-register and re-partner with Dance Marathon, that's a great time um, to share with them your fundraising impact. Mm -hmm. um, that really is what drives home is that it's more than just this event um, that their members sign up for, but it's truly knowing that their members have made an impact. Um, that they have made an impact and such a great opportunity to show that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so a good way too to build uh, prospects with teams is to start a team captain program. Um, many of you might not have implemented this or, you know, coming off a few years or even just starting, you, you know, this is a great best practice to start when your program is still young so that you don't have to unbuild some things later in your years when you realize that you're not getting as many teams as you would like. So a team captain basically serves as the head liaison from a team to your organization. So it's someone that can help you with recruitment, with education, with fundraising encouragement, or fundraising stewardship. Um, it's really just the go-to person in the organization and on the team that can help you disseminate information. Um, team captains are very, very beneficial because it's someone that's in the organization communicating with the organization. So you as a stranger don't have to go to you know, the nursing association's team and say, you know, do this, do that, do this. It's someone that they know. It's someone they already trust. It's someone that they can easily get in contact with as well, telling them, hey, a push day is coming up or, hey, the main event is in three weeks. Um, and so team captains will really make your life easier if um, you can find the right people and execute the program uh, correctly. So you might be asking, where do I find these team captains? How do I get a team captain for these teams? Um, and so if you are a program that's going into second, third, fourth, fifth year even, um, you guys can think about participants that were top fundraisers last year, um, participants that will be returning. So if they've already participated in the dance marathon, they already know about, you know, what the main event is, what they can expect, things like that. So, um, you know, looking at draw, pulling a list of returning participants from, dance, from your donor drive page and then emailing all of them and seeing if anybody would be interested. Um, emailing top participants, um, emailing people that were like the team captains on donor drive last year. So if they were the first people to start their organization's team last year, um, would they be a good team captain this year? Um, so really thinking about people who have demonstrated a higher level of engagement with your organization before, um, and then reaching out to them first. Uh, and if they don't want to, or if they've graduated or something like that, they might have someone that they can recommend. So utilizing that very intentional outreach of, even if it can't be you, who do you think would be great to be your team captain or who participated last year that you think would be awesome in this leadership role? Um, and that's also a conversation that you can have with organization presidents or service and philanthropy chairs, things like that. Those people that are already involved in leadership of an organization on campus or a club on campus are probably not gonna have time to be your team captains and or even if they do, they might not carry out the duties, you know, to the level that you want them to. So asking them, do you have members in your organization that 
this might be a good role for them? Or can you suggest, you know, someone that we can reach out to that, you know, would be willing to help us out and be our team captain? Because that way you're going to get these people that, you know, are already demonstrated leaders in their organization, or, you know, you can go to them and say, we have a personal recommendation for you to be the team captain this year. Um, and that will go a long way, I think. Um, and then once you have these people that have said, okay, I'm interested, like what does being a team captain entail? Really setting out the expectations of what you want them to do. So if you want them to attend a meeting uh, once a month, letting them know that, or once, you know, twice a semester, letting them know that. Um, letting them know that they might have to have a little bit of extra time certain weeks to communicate with their members um, at a higher level, things like that. Um, I think one of the worst things you can do is not tell people ahead of time what their expectations are, and then they get into the role and they say, whoa, this is way more than I agreed to do at first. I can't do this anymore, because then you're just, you know, you're back to square zero, you're out a team captain again. So um, letting them know that, you know, it might be a little bit of extra time commitment, and it might be a little bit, uh, a few extra meetings every semester, but, you know, if you give that to them at the beginning and they say, sure, I'm willing to do it, at least they've been warned, I like to say, about, you know, what level of commitment they might have to have. Um, and then, even after you have team captains, you still will want to go in and pitch to teams. So you, our guys, are going to be the first communication of how they can get involved, and then your team captains will follow up reminding people to register or to get involved. So a great way to pitch to teams is through organization presentations. So reaching out to presidents and service chairs to see if you can present at meetings or, um, you know, during chapter, if they're an organization that has chapter, things like that. Um, and just giving a short five to 10 minute presentation, you know, the way Kyle was talking, why are we an organization? How do we execute our fundraising and, you know, what you guys have to do to get involved, things like that. Um, if you're not having much success, or even if you are having success, reaching to leadership, reaching out to leadership councils at schools. Um, I have a few universities that went straight to Panhellenic, IFCs, multicultural leadership councils and said, we would love it if it was sort of a soft requirement for houses to or organizations to participate in our event. And, you know, they've had success there. They've had, there are schools where IFCs have made it a requirement for fraternities to participate um, and things like that. And I, I would say, be careful with the word requirement. We never want it to make, we don't want to make it feel like it's just something they have to do. And so they put in the bare minimum, but, you know, working out a partnership with these councils to say, what can you offer houses or organizations that will incentivize them to join our cause? And then, you know, you give them a great experience and they want to do it regardless of whether IFC is giving their house service points or whatever it is. So, um, you know, residential life too. Like, can we create hall teams? Can we have the RAs make teams for some, you know, extra benefit from the residence life associations? So you can get creative and if you have, um, strong campus advisors that can help you get in touch with people, um, certainly consider that an avenue to encourage teams to sign up. Um, and then, like I said, use your team captains. After you pitch to an org or after you go in and give the presentation, have team captains follow up. Um, team captains will always be at those organization meetings or chapter meetings, so they can always stand up really quickly and just say, hey, don't forget, dance marathon registration, join our team, be our folks. Um, and that will really, really help in terms of having a direct pipeline of communication to teams and as a reminder to teams that they can sign up and they can join the movement. Absolutely. And then, you know, Beck, as we're looking at pitching to teams, that's also a fantastic opportunity for retention and stewardship. Um, and especially when you go to visit that student organization, sharing with them the previous year's impact and what their organization did. Um, it's a great time to do some storytelling um, behind the funds you're raising and its impact at the local hospital, um, whether that is through showing pictures or videos of um, the work that's being done at the local hospital because you're fundraising, or if you work with your local hospital to see if we can bring a miracle family to come with you um, and they can share their story of their journey at the Children's Hospital and why it's so important you're fundraising, but it's just another stewardship and retention point. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, pitching to teams is an annual thing. Um, it's not just a, a one time, it's going back every single year and, um, and how we make it different is doing the teaching behind the impact of your fundraising the year before. Absolutely. Awesome. 
Next is looking at um, now that we've, you know, we focused on our teams, uh, but we also want to make sure that the rest of the student body that may not be involved in a club or organization um, can be involved in our movement or if they're a first year student. So looking at recruitment um, from a different lens, but it's really targeted. So now that you focus on your teams, how do we get first year students um, involved in Dance Marathon? Um, as freshmen, you probably remember back in your freshman, like, you are exposed to so many clubs and organizations um, and how can dance marathon one um, be one of those organizations that they're exposed to but two, be the organization that they want to be involved in and we break through the noise um, so it's really important that we do outreach for first year students whether that is through our resident halls and partnering with our resident life association or our ras is so that the ras can be able to share with their in their jobs as an ra like our jobs are to create community um, and create that experience for the first year. And how can Dance Marathon help do that? Um, RAs are always thinking of events that they have to put on. Um, they're always thinking of things that they can do as a whole. And how can we pitch to our resident life and say, hey, you know, we want to make your life easier. Dance Marathon has all these special events going on. Um, RAs, would you be willing to bring your freshmen to these events um, so that they can learn about Dance Marathon and be involved? Um, there's also great resources, whether it's reaching out to all of your student service departments on campus. Um, they're always trying to think of ways that they can engage their freshmen. Um, they know that first year retention rate is so important. Um, for, for them to go from a first year to their second year, that defines their graduation rates. So sitting down and building a partnership, whether it's the Dean of Students office um, or your service learning offices, and really asking them, hey, how can we help support you with best getting freshmen involved on campus? Um, is knowing that Dance Marathon hits on a lot of the student learning outcomes that universities are trying to achieve, whether it's the student learning, um, engagement, retention, peer management, there's a lot of things that you all, um, and what we do to ultimately fill those student learning outcomes. So meeting, it's really important to meet the students where they are. Um, it's so easy for us just to have a table on campus and expect a student to walk by um, and sign up, but that's not all students are walking by tables on campus, so let's meet them where they are, whether that is in, in the resident halls or at the student service centers or those places and physical buildings on campus that they're, they're, they're most often. Um, some campuses may have buildings and lecture halls that are primarily for freshmen. Let's table there. Um, let's meet the freshmen where they are. Um, as freshmen, we sometimes have those uh, university one-on-one -on -one classes that hundreds and hundreds of students have to be in an lecture hall. Um, so build a partnership with that professor. And, and they often look um, for organizations to talk about. The University of South Carolina um, does a phenomenal job at with their, their first year freshman class um, that they actually teach all the freshmen about Dance Marathon. Um, it's because they simply just went to the professor um, and shared with them about the organization and, and highlighted how this truly is a part of their college experience. And you all can do the same exact thing, no matter how old or how young your program is. Um, next is your non-affiliated students, very similar to your first year students. Um, not every student is involved in a club or organization on campus, and that's okay. Um, so how can we make Dance Marathon their home on campus? Um, and so targeting non-affiliated students, um, one of the best ways is um, for your, is, is your resident halls. That's one, um, your dining halls, but also let's say you have a commuter school. Um, table outside of the, you know, the bus stops where the commuter students are there. They're always looking, especially like getting off the bus early in the morning, they want a free cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. uh, so how can you do a free cup of coffee and a donut? Um, and they stop by and you say, hey, we wanna invite you to be a part of Dance Marathon. Um, and so meeting the students where they are is gonna be extremely important. Awesome. Next is your year-long communication. Um, something that we keep driving, <laughs> driving home is after, after a participant signs up for Dance Marathon, um, they have to hear back from us um, and we have to engage them. If we truly want um, hundreds, if not thousands of students to attend our Dance Marathon main event, we have to ensure that we engage them and interact with them all year long. Um, so after they register, we ensure that they're educated. Um, they're educated on how and why to fundraise. We can do that through email marketing, our social media, texting, team captains, um, or a participant handbook. 
um, but ensuring that there's multiple ways that you're, you're educating those participants. Next is throughout the year, sharing about the cause. Um, your, your hospital is gonna be, um, your local hospital advisor is gonna be your biggest resource and asset. Um, so being able to get information about what are the current things that are going on at the Children's Hospital, um, whether it's breakthrough research happening um, or some of the inspiring stories from patients and families that are being treated um, and sharing that with your participants and inspiring them um, about why they're fundraising and how their fundraising is making an impact and doing that through your social media, um, your email marketing, on, tabling on campus, um, but driving that cause connection. And then fundraising. Um, let's make it fun. Let's make it exciting. You know, your push days and push weeks are often some of those most exciting times where it has that momentum and feeling of something bigger than yourself on campus um, because individuals are going to fundraise because others are doing it. And so if they see them having fun through it, whether it's through our social media competitions um, or through other outlets, um, we have to make it exciting. Um, next, year-long communications, your special events. As we mentioned, those events are great recruitment tools. They're great retention tools. Um, these special events are just a great way to engage um, and activate your participants and create that sense of year-long movement. Um, and then lastly, um, we have to recognize and steward our participants. Um, you know, there, when you see that final number and you see tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars raised, that's because each individual participant did their part. Um, and without one participant, it would be less. Um, it would be less of an impact. And so it's really key that we're recognizing our participants, whether that's through on social media and we're doing our shout outs um, to when they hit their fundraising goals, it's our email marketing. Um, so we have tons of great resources for you as you are um, looking at building out some of those templated communication plans. When you have a participant hit certain milestones, um, they're getting triggered notifications. Um, and those triggered notifications can be built into your donor drive or they get an automatic email thanking them. Um, but the more that we can make it truly personal, um, whether it is, you know, an exec board member, um, you know, once every couple of weeks, you, you pull a donor drive report um, for all of your participants that have hit certain fundraising levels and we just call them and just say thank you. Um, I know like I'm the same way, picking up a phone may be weird, mm -hmm. um, but, it, but sometimes when you get that phone call, it just feels so good. Um, but you get that text message that just says, thank you so much for what you're doing. And you have a personal story from one of the miracle families or a miracle mom. Um, and she's, she's sharing because of you, it happens. But it's important that we, we thank them throughout the year because the more that they're recognized and they, we affirm what they're doing, um, they're going to keep on wanting to fundraise more. Um, that positive reinforcement is going to be really key. And, um, <laughs> I want to, we want to thank you so much for joining our today's session on how to build a movement. You know, we walked through the social media, the branding, um, your recruitment, your participant and team recruitment and engagement. Um, but all of these different components are going to, how you're going to truly build a movement on your campus. Um, it's not just one of these. It takes each and every one of these different focuses in order to build a really sustainable and strong dance marathon program. Um, and so throughout um, the rest of these, there's going to be more sessions as well. So make sure you tune into those um, emerging dance marathon sessions. If you have any other questions or you're curious about more information, feel free to drop a question into our Discord um, channel. If you're not a part of that Discord channel, um, you can just search the new and emerging channel. And then feel free to text, uh, text email <laughs> Becca or myself, and we would be more than happy to help you and answer any of these questions. But you also have a ton of advisement support from your CMN hospitals and your local hospital advisor and your campus advisor that would love to support you. Then lastly, your biggest, your biggest resources are, are your peers. Um, so feel free to reach out to other dance marathon programs um, and as well as your peers that are part of the new emerging sessions. Thank you so much, guys. It was great to be with you today, and we will look forward to talking to you soon. Please reach out to us with any questions or concerns.